Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. Something very different today. I'm going to show you around my 1971 TR6 petrol injection. Now I put a picture of this car up on my Instagram I think a couple of weeks ago and someone said you should start doing classic cars on the channel and change the name to No Talk and I actually thought that was quite funny. But obviously being an engineer I do have a big love of cars and I've had this car for about 11 years now and through the work the guy before me did on it and the work I've done on it, it's in pretty good nick now. It's not a show winning car, but it's not far off. Underneath, it's better than the body. On the body, there's a fair few strawberries on the paintwork. The paint's a bit thin. It doesn't polish very well. In fact, most of the paint comes off if you try and polish it. But underneath, it's absolutely solid. The powder coated chassis is more of a spectacle than the top is. That makes me pretty happy, really. The engine's in pretty good fettle. It's a 2.5 inline six with mechanical fuel injection. That's a pain in the ass to set up, as we'll come on to when we start driving. It's not calibrated perfectly, and anyone who says they're getting 150 horsepower on a dyno from these cars, which is what they were quoted at, so the PI cars, the petrol injection cars, were quoted at 150 horsepower. If anyone claiming they're actually getting that, I think that's a very optimistic figure for an injection car and I, I probably would say a car set up properly on carbs is probably going to be a better performance car than the injection cars because the mechanical fuel injection from Lucas on this is very difficult to set up and we'll get into that it's a very nuanced calibration and it really has to be calibrated to your block and to your manifold because it runs off manifold pressure that's how it meters the fuel it has to work well with the spark timing it has to work well with your throttle body calibration and your butterfly calibration it's a very very kind of uh, one-off piece of engineering and it should never have really got into a series production car but that's what british cars were in the 70s and the 60s they really shouldn't have never left the factory in the state they were in it was an, an ambitious project the lucas fuel injection well, i'm not going to bore you with that if you want to read that backstory on Triumphs, TR6s and Lucas Fuel Injection, you can go to Wikipedia because I'm not just going to read out what Wikipedia can tell you. I'm going to tell you about what it's like to own and drive this car and tell you some of the little things you might not know about. Let's go for a drive. But let's start with all what you want to hear first, and that's the engine. So the engine in here is a 2.5 inline 6. And they did this engine in two different variants. They did it in an injection type and a carburetor type. The US car has got the carbs for emissions. This has got the original Lucas mechanical fuel injection, which I will tell you now, if you get it working properly and reliably, it's a bit of a peach. But how does the fuel injection system work? It's not electronic, it's purely mechanical. It runs off, uh, well, it's controlled by manifold depression or manifold pressure. And it's fed by a vacuum from the inlet manifold. The fuel is metered basically based upon the manifold pressure and how much throttling you're giving the car. Now, along with that, the car's got six individual throttle bodies or six individual butterflies. Setting the butterflies up is also very tricky and the calibration of the butterflies is an art in itself. If you change the calibration of the throttles, the butterflies, you change the fuel metering. The fuel metering depends on that and that depends on the fuel metering so it's hard to calibrate your fuel injection system you know in the factory and put it on every single car expecting it to work in the same cow you really need to calibrate it for that engine every engine is slightly different every manifold pressure is slightly different every car has different throttle bodies due to tolerances and the setup of the butterflies so getting the Lucas fuel injection right and getting it set up for your car, really you need to take the car and the fuel injection meet, uh, metering unit and have it basically custom calibrated to your car. Overdrive, second, third, fourth in this car. Uh, it works pretty reliably once it's dialed in. Sorry about the brakes, kind of racy brake pads in here. Overdrive can go wrong, but it's normally an electronic problem I found, a solenoid problem. Once it's set up and working, if you keep using it and you use it hard, it kicks in pretty well. And it's essential in this car, and I'll tell you why. In this car, I've got a different ratio, a different final drive ratio in the diff. It's got basically a, a more of a hill climbing diff or a sprint diff. 
So that's a different ratio. It's a 4.1, I believe, on the diff. So it reduces basically the total gearing of the car and makes it a little bit punchy around lanes like these. But on the motorway, on the dual carriageway, at 60 or 100 k's an hour, 60 miles an hour, 100 kilometers an hour, it's a bit noisy because you're ramming up at sort of 3,500 RPM on a cruise. Now, going back to the fuel injection system and how, how much of a pain in the ass it is to set up. I found, through experience, you can set it up better for cruise on a dual carriageway or on a motorway, or you can set it up better for punchy acceleration and high torque and, and the manifold pressure kind of characteristics that go along with that. And that's how I've got it set up. I can't really find a sweet spot for both. At cruise, it tends to be a bit flat when I put my foot down. I haven't really got the best spark timing set up on the car. I've never really found the sweet spot. And again, with spark timing on the distributor, I can make that better for cruise or I can make it better for acceleration. But I can't seem to find a middle ground. And that's just the way it is. The distributor has a vacuum advance module on it. I don't actually run that connected because I find the car runs better without it. I'm not sure if they ever were intended to have the vacuum advance fitted or not, but I don't use it. You can see the car responds pretty well to the uh, overdrive flipping on and off. And it actually is much quicker to engage under load. You take your foot off the gas and you try and disengage the overdrive, it's a little bit slower. So, Engine-wise, it's pretty sweet. It's quite a heavy iron block. Most of the mechanicals are solid. The really worrying thing is the fuel injection system. If you've got a car on carbs, it's pretty simple. Once the car's set up on carbs, you know, it's easier to live with, I would say. Um, I've done a lot of work on this, on the injectors. The injectors really don't like old fuel. I mean, no injectors do, but these are very sensitive to being used got to use these injectors a lot otherwise they dribble when they dribble you get a misfire the car backfires a lot as you get a lot of hot fuel into the exhaust so it's a car that likes to be driven and not sat around if it's on injectors and the, and the Lucas fuel injection so that's the engine dealt with next thing the chassis of the body unlike something like an MGB or a Mini of the same era this is a separate body on top of a ladder chassis the ladder chassis that have been restored that have cars this age are pretty solid. The steel's quite good, and if it's got a decent powder coating or paint or wax oil, it tends to last a fair while. The body is just bolted on top. It doesn't really add much rigidity to the car. Obviously, it's a soft top, so it's pretty floppy, and the, the body and the floor pans don't really add much sheer stiffening to the chassis. So around country bends, I would say, something like an MGB will actually drive better if you're really pushing it. But this car basically, believe it or not, has independent suspension all round. But it's kind of, it's nice to have that, but it feels like the, the chassis and the body stiffness can't really keep up with the demands of that. And it encourages you to push the car on. I mean, the, the rear shocks and springs are trailing arm, so it's kind of independent. Um, this has got adjustable gas dampers on the rear, with the standard shocks and springs on the front. And I've actually tuned the rear dampers to be much harder than they would be on the stock lever arm dampers. And that's to take some of the wallowiness out of the body. Because if you really push it around in the bends, the body's just not stiff enough and the car does feel wallowy. Uh, the shock, the, sh the spring rate is quite low. So increasing the dampers, don't forget that will also increase the compression damping. Just makes the rear end feel a bit more taut and takes some away of that wallowiness of the flex in the whole car. Because obviously there's no roof either, so there's really not much sheer stiffening to the whole car. Brakes, discs up front, drums at the back. I've never really driven the car hard enough to really test them and get them really hot, but I have to say they stop the car really, really sharp. It's very easy to lock the brakes up on this. The car doesn't wear a lot. Electrics, car's probably had, I would say, from my experience, a whole new harness front to back, basically. Um, I've plumbed in a USB cigarette lighter so I can put wireless charging for the phone, sat nav, everything like that plumb that into the ignition circuit so it doesn't drain the battery when the car's laid up. And that's, that's about it really, it's a standard fuse box. The car has electronic ignition, which took some, took some setting up and dialing in with the distributor, but it's much more reliable than an old point system, especially when you don't use the car too much. Um, it just tends to work, you don't need to, you don't need to adjust the points like you would in an old, an old point system.
the normal steering wheel would have been a leather bound smaller diameter wheel which I'm actually thinking of changing just because you know I'm tall it gives me a bit more space to maneuver the wheel and by my knees especially when driving pretty spiritedly this is better obviously bigger diameter there's more steering torque at low speeds I've got slightly stickier wider rubber than what would be stock because I've got the Yokohamas on the, on the front and the rear so at low speeds you know no power steering it's, it's a bit of a muscle to move the car around um, you've got to get it rolling to really be able to park it so parking wise is a bit clunky um, but other than that it's pretty easy to live with this car. Comment down below, um, there's probably loads of things I've missed off of this car. I haven't really gone through the history of the TRs and the Triumphs because who wants to hear me just read out what you can read on Wikipedia and that's what most car channels do. I'm going to tell you more about what it's like to actually own these cars, um, restore them, work on them. Working on any old car is a doddle. What, people, what puts people off about this is, like I said, the Lucas fuel injection. It is quirky. Once you get it set up and running right, and you use it, it likes to be used, the seals and the diaphragms need to be used, then it tends to be more or less quite reliable. A cheaper car, one on carburettors, one that's been set up nicely, you've got a very, very usable classic. Apart from if it rains, it will rust overnight. When these things left the factory, they leaked like a sieve. I still don't know how the windows are supposed to interface with the roof, no one knows and it's just a fact of life that if it rains overnight heavily you will end up with a puddle on the floor. Right so that's probably enough spiel for now, there's probably loads of things I've missed, we've discussed body, we've discussed chassis, uh, engine, fuel injection, what have we done, brakes, we'll get out on some more spirited roads and we'll try to push it around a bit and we'll feel how wallowy we See the roof's falling down. Feel how wallowy the car is when you really push it around. Get a bit of shut and backlash from the diff. I'm not sure if that's the actual brown wheel backlash or the mount seat look the app. Doesn't seem to happen in the lower gears, which means it's related to high speed prop. So gas quite a lot because this road is exceptionally narrow. Hot holes and pigeons everywhere. That one nearly got taken out of the windscreen. Now, the car's pulling about 2,500, 3,000 rev around here. I'm only doing 40 miles an hour and it's top here. So now you know what I'm talking about when I said it's got that different final drive. People call it dip in it. Maybe I should start a new channel or make some playlists on this channel. We'll call it Peaky's Garage or No Talk. Um, but yeah, cars are a big part of my life, always have been, always will be. I wish I could get access to more cars, but this is my, my pride and joy. It's something I've worked on for probably nearly 11 years now. And yeah, I'm glad I was able to share it with you today. And, uh, great buzz driving it around and pooning it around a little bit we'll take it easy on the way home i'll see you in the next one